touching story about an odd couple who run away together. This time yesterday, I was thinking this time tomorrow I'd be on train with my lover, speeding through countryside. What's wrong? Look at us, Lily. You're so young. Age doesn't count. Yeah, it's experience of life that counts, I know that. Mm. I'm gonna send my dad a picture postcard and say, I'm having a lovely time. Glad you're not here. Ain't Lily. <laughs> you know, if the truth be told, Lily, my life is made up of moments. You know, with long grey patches in between. Good and bad moments, but mainly bad. Don't say it, Colin. This is a good moment. Yeah, because of you, Lily. You raised me up when I was low. You gave me comfort in my hour of need. Oh, come on, I'm starving. Bill Patterson and Cindy Holden in Lily, My Love, the screenplay, this Wednesday at 9.25 on 2. Now, the real life drama of those in the fast lane as we join Murray Walker for highlights of today's German Grand Prix. Uh, for all the news on the run-up to that Hungarian Grand Prix on August the 9th, as well as reports from the first and second day's practice and a round-up uh, after the race itself, you can phone the BBC Grand Prix line. Uh, details of the telephone number to ring are also on page 63 of this week's Radio Times. Now, just before the week in the Lords, a quick look at our line-up for tomorrow evening here on 2, the Norman Wisdom a comedy Just My Lux at ten past six. And at 7.30, another story about the Special Operations Executive of the Second World War, Englandspiel, the tragic tale of the SOE's greatest disaster, which cost the lives of 54 agents. There's a futuristic adventure with the Star Cops at 8.30, followed by comedy with the two Ronnies. And at 10.15, highlights of the day's play in the fourth test, followed by Newsnight at 10.45. That's tomorrow, here on 2. Now, to round off this evening, Christopher Jones reports on the proceedings in Parliament's upper chamber during the week in the Lords. <laughs> One of the easiest things in the world to do is to apologise. It's one of the simplest things. It's so much easier. People will not do it, but I never know why. Because if you say you're sorry, you could actually, in politics, in both the House of Commons households, get away with practically anything in this life. If having done it, you got up and said you were sorry. Lord Whitelaw, the leader of the Lords, distilling for me the wisdom of a lifetime in politics. Wisdom which he was obliged to put to practical use the day after we talked. And we'll see how and why he did it later in this programme. According to another and equally experienced politician, the Labour peer Lord Houghton of Serby, the House of Lords has become a classic example of British genteel poverty. A bit over the top, perhaps, considering who some of its members are. But in the week when MPs in the Commons blandly voted themselves and their secretaries huge pay increases, the Lords were agonising over whether they should allow themselves an extra £2 a day to add to the £20 a day they get, if they actually turn up, to pay for secretarial help plus to pay for stamps and books and papers and so on. In addition to this, they do get £20 a day subsistence allowance if they come to the house, and £52 a night for those without homes here in London. And those allowances are not going up, just the secretarial ones. Perhaps they thought it was time to have two classes of peers, those who do most of the work, who'd get extra secretarial allowances, and those who aren't so active, who'd stay with things as they are. For the peers, this is really rather a delicate little dilemma. And the first question which we have to decide, which might, may, as time goes on, cause a little difficulty, is what is exactly an active backbench peer? And who, of course, decides who is such an active backbench peer? And, of course, what does activity consist of? Indeed, my lords, it is a hoary problem to define what an active peer is. At one time, your lordships had what is now referred to an, as an assiduity allowance, that if, in fact, you attended a given, you could not, in fact, claim for attendance unless you had attended a minimum number of occasions. Uh, that, my lords, uh, 
told against those peers who might have certain special interests and did not attend very often and were therefore penalised. Another suggestion has been made that it should be on the number of votes a peer makes. That, my lords, I think would also run into difficulties. My lords, even further suggestions have been made that it should be based on the column inches a peer speaks. <laughs> That, my lords, I think would inevitably lead to inevitable grinding to a halt of the proceedings of your lordship's house. One of the most active peers, Lord Boyd Carpenter, said that the secretarial allowance should not depend on peers actually going to the house because they did a lot of work during the recesses. There is a steady volume of correspondence, which in my own experience, and that's all I can give your lordships, uh, was fairly substantial when we went on television and has steadily been expanding since. And the brutal fact remains that it doesn't stop when tonight your Lordship's house uh, rises for three months. Lord Houghton of Sowerby said that the services he got as a peer were pretty much the same as he would had as an income tax clerk in 1915, but at least then he'd had a telephone of his own. But one thing I think is pretty simple that uh, so long as we have to go to the House of Commons for the money, we won't probably have the sympathetic consideration that we ought to have, but at least they're not constantly talking of abolishing us as they used to be. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we are at least safe in our genteel poverty. We can rely on keeping it, uh, and we can now, I think, build on it. Uh, one thing about the House of Commons is that what they want, they put down a resolution to get, they vote for it despite the government's objection, and they all go home and say, we have settled it. And they have. And they know how to do it. We are supplements. They are masters of finance. And indeed, their ambitions now far exceed those of the House of Commons of the past. Anyway, let's have a go at it. Let's try to find the solution, and I think we'll make conditions happier all right. And then we will write our correspondence with a lighter heart, we'll be more courteous to the people who worry us, and we can put at the bottom, we receive no state aid like the RSPCA. <laughs> Lord Houghton, the Labour opposition in the Lords got very cross this week about the way that a junior government spokesman, Lord Aaron, had answered questions after he made a statement on the future of the Polytechnics. Lord Aaron was repeating a statement already made in the Commons by the Education Secretary, Mr Kenneth Baker, and the peers complained that Lord Aaron refused to confirm to them some of the details about particular education authorities given to MPs by Mr Baker. So they complained to Lord Whitelaw as leader of the House. The next day, Lord Whitelaw, very placatory, explained that a junior minister in the Lords was not always in the position to go as far as the Secretary of State himself. I wish to apologize unreservedly to the House for this failure in communication on the part of the government, for which, of course, I am responsible. I can assure the House that while statements are repeated in this House, some time after they have been delivered in another place, I shall ensure that Lords Ministers are fully acquainted with what was said in another place, such, so that such inconsistencies may be avoided for the future. My Lords, I would like to thank the Leader of the House for that statement uh, and for his usual uh, courtesy and precision uh, in, 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 in making it. Uh, may I assure him that uh, I accept what he has said uh, unreservedly uh, with, and without any qualification or hesitation. My Lords, I too am, uh, participated in yesterday's proceedings at this point and therefore I would like on behalf of all the Alliance benches to say how grateful we are to the Leader of the House for having dealt with this matter in his usual, masterly, responsible way for which we are duly grateful. Lord Diamond. And when I talked to Lord Whitelaw in his office in the Lords this week, he explained to me the tactful and indeed the tactical necessity of being able to apologise. But first I asked him about allowances for peers. Ministers in the Lords, together with the leader of the opposition and the chief whip there, are getting increases in their ministerial salaries of over £4,000 a year from next January. 
But apart from those secretarial allowance increases, the allowance for all the other peers, including the opposition shadow ministers, are staying the same. Was this, I asked Lord Whitelaw, fair? Well, I think it's a very important matter of principle to look at here. First of all, it has been decided in a house which is not elected, not therefore made up of people who are expected to come necessarily all the time to it, but the best way of dealing with the problem of their expenses is that they should have an allowance. Uh, allowance to meet their expenses both of subsistence in London, of living in London overnight and subsistence during the day. Now this system uh, is properly because it is expenses is free of tax. Now on the other hand you have the ministers who have a salary uh, which is of course subject to tax and e they because they are getting a salary do not get the expenses allowance. So there are two different sorts of people. As for the uh, increase uh, for the um, ministers of, at all levels in the Lords, we felt it was very important that when the Commons ministers were getting that part of their salary which is uh, kept for their constituency duties, which is assigned to their constituency duties that right way, and the House of Commons was getting a considerable increase to meet uh, the new arrangements of tying in with senior principals in the civil service, that if the Lords Ministers didn't get something, uh, then of course they would fall very much behind. I mean already, perfectly properly, uh, they are, have much lower salaries than those in the Commons, because none of us get a constituency uh, complement, as you might say. And I, of course, am one of those who know that very well, because in 1983, uh, I, by coming to the Lords as a Cabinet Minister, uh, my salary dropped very considerably. But so it should have, as a matter of fact, because I was doing much less work, because I didn't have a constituency. Uh, I don't say necessarily it has turned out that I was doing much less work in the final event, but that was the theory of it, at least. And uh, the proper theory, because a constituency does today demand a great deal of work. And that particular work I don't do any longer, and nor do the Lord's Ministers. But we have kept the differential where it was before, and I think that's fair. I would have been very worried if the Lord's Ministers had had a wider differential, and had been paid a great deal less, even even more uh, in deficiency than they were before. I think yeah. that could have been a great mistake. Lord Whitelaw, talking about the Lords Ministers, uh, you have, in the last uh, couple of weeks, had effectively to get one uh, senior minister more or less off the hook in the House of Lords. Uh, one or two others have, I think, incurred the wrath of the opposition by their perhaps lack of briefing, it seemed, in the House of Lords. Are you quite satisfied that all the, particularly the younger ministers on the front bench, the government front bench and the Lords, are as skillful as they might be? Well, I